Okay, let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and we're going to continue. We've been in this chapter for a while now. I think it's about our fourth, or I think it's our fourth session. But I'm making no excuses because I, need the, I believe these things are needful. And some great teaching in here for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and we'll pick up at, at verse uh, 17, and we'll read right through to the end of verse 24. Chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians, and commencing at verse 17. Please follow along with me. Only as the Lord has assigned to each one, as God has called each, in this manner let him walk. And so I direct in all the churches. Was any man called when he was already circumcised? He is not to become uncircumcised. Has anyone been called in uncircumcision? He is not to be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. But what matters is the keeping of the commandments of God. Verse 20. Each man must remain in that condition in which he was called. Were you called while a slave? Do not worry about it. But if you are able to become free, rather do that. For he who was called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freed man. Likewise, he who was called while free is Christ's slave. You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brethren, each one is to remain with God in that condition in which he was called. We have an interesting um, uh, section of scripture this morning, but it's a continuation really of a theme with a different slant of what we've already looked at. And uh, those things that we've looked at were problems in the Corinthian church that needed God's instruction on. In our text today, we have another one of those problems or issues that is given divine instruction through the inspired writings of the Apostle Paul. But first of all, before we're going to get into the text specifically, what I want to do is just to launch out and give you the overall principle that's being laid down in this section that we have just read together. And that is, believers in Jesus Christ need not be concerned with changing their outward circumstances or their lot in life. That's it, period. I want you to grab hold of that principle and tuck it away there in your mind and think about it as we extrapolate a little bit further of what this text says. But it's basically simple. In other words, true Christianity is not about changing what we do and what we are in order to change the world. We can look at it from that angle. But it's all about, true Christianity is all about being changed internally by the Spirit of God And living that spiritual change out in a broken world, wherever we are. You got that? This is important because so many people who call themselves Christian, or so many people who are not Christian and who look on Christianity, think it's all about external change and what we do and and so forth and what we don't do and, and, and things. That's secondary. Even third and fourth down the place. It's all about internal change. You see, Paul has already stated this principle in regard to one's marital status about um, wherever we are, we're to live this internal change out. He's already stated that. He tells us readers earlier on, he said, you have no reason to say that because we're Christian... We must really go in for being celibate or single. Remember that? Because that's what they were doing. They were concerned again on this even occasion about external change. Oh, now that we're Christian, we must stay single. Or even those who are married. Oh, we must refrain from intimacy with our spouses. And Paul says also, you have no reason to say that because we are Christian... We must get rid of our unsaved spouse because someone was saying that. Oh, wow. This doesn't look good for me as a Christian to be hooked up with a pagan. 
So we'll get rid of them. No, no, no. Paul says no. So the same principle was applied here. And in our text, the same thinking was the issue. They were saying because we're Christian, we have need to change. We need to change our social status, our employment, our area of influence. Why? Because the gospel has set us free. But Paul's message here is that Christianity was never designed to be a disruptor of social relationships. Never. Yet that was exactly what the Corinthian church and the believers were doing. As many, I might say, believers do today. They use their Christian faith as justification to change their social status, which really, underneath it all, was a means to just satisfy their own selfish, prideful desires. That's where it boils down to. And so this was happening in their homes, and now it was going broader into their everyday working lives. So Paul's already dealt with the the marital status and that side of thing, and and, and now he he, he comes and, and, and looks at this external emphasis in Christianity in a broader aspect. So what does Paul say on this? He says this, don't make Christianity into a social thing where you have people looking at you and thinking that your faith, your faith is all about externally changing things. For instance, your marital status and your circumstances, your job and even culture itself. Some Christians are like that. Oh wow, we've got to change culture. And we make this world a better place is to vote in Christian politicians. And that's a major emphasis. I'm going to leave that one with you to see where we land on it by the rest of the day. And they also say, make sure you know, Paul says, make sure you know it's a spiritual regeneration of the heart that allows a believer in Jesus Christ to exist in any of these social settings. You got that? I pray this point to be before that we are all missionaries no matter where we are in the workplace. And as we think about that, as we think about that, existing as a believer in any of these social settings and the influence it would have, when we think about the Lord Jesus. He never came to instigate change through social reform, folks. Never. He didn't come to change the government. Remember, he debouted the authorities of the Roman government of his day. His mission was to seek and save that which was lost, Mark 10, 45. And that's our mission. Simple. That's our mission. That's the mission of the church. You see, when Christianity, when Christianity is only valued and promoted for what it can do socially and externally, the power of the gospel gets substituted and loses its influence to change people from within. It really does. True Christianity, can I say, and I'm not being offensive here, is not about going and being Mother Teresa's. She was a great lady as far as Social reform, right? But true Christianity is not about that. And my prayer this morning is that as believers, we might be true salt and light. That's what it's about, isn't it? True salt and light. Wherever the Lord has providentially placed us. To what? To display it, to display His grace that has regenerated us as individuals from within. Through faith in Jesus Christ. So as we unfold this section, for clarity's sake, my first heading this morning is the principle identified. And we see this principle here of staying put, first identified in verse 17. And as I said before, he's already discussed this principle of staying put in their marriages. And um, how the the believer is to stay with the unbeliever, uh, spouse who is is married, etc. And uh, there's a staying put principle there. And so the careful reader will have noted this morning already that this principle is restated three times exactly. Three times in this section that we have read. The first time is in verse 17. This is what it says. Only as the Lord has assigned to each one, as God has called each, in this manner let him walk. 
The second time, in verse 20, each man must remain in that condition in which he was called. And the third time, in verse 24, brethren, each one is to remain with God in that condition in which he was, he was called. So these three statements kind of divide up this text that we've read into two parts, uh, which I will use uh, for the uh, message this morning. Verse 17 is the principle that's laid down and stated for us. Verses 18 to 20, we see how this principle is applied to cultural and religious practices. And then finally, we see this principle applied to our work status and social standing. We see that in verses 21 and 24. First of all, we need to give attention to this key word here. And you would have noticed that good Bible student, see this like you are, it's repeated over and over again. A matter of fact, it's repeated eight times. Eight times. It's the word call, the calling. And so we need to ask, what is this calling? What kind of calling is meant here? Because to some it can be confusing. And of those eight times, it is a direct reference to the divine call of God in a person's life to repentance and faith. I want you to understand that very clearly. This calling here is not about a calling as into an engineer or your calling as into a doctor or your calling as into a floor cleaner or whatever you might be. This calling here, eight times it's mentioned, is in relation to the call of God. Where the Spirit of God effectually regenerates a sinner and they come to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. Now those who have a King James Version will notice that there's a ninth time the word calling or called is used. And it's used in verse 20. But this is a different word. I don't want to bore you with all this heavier stuff. But this is a different word than the used in the other eight times. So the word, the Greek word there is klesis. And um, modern translations have translated this word in verse 20 as condition. That's what I have in my New American Standard Bible. And a very accurate translation, a good, a, a good, good word. Whereas the other eight times, this word call is kaleo, not klesis, kaleo. And kaleo means call or summoned. It's like a summons from the court. You know when you get handed a summons? You don't say, oh no, I don't want to bother about that. Well, maybe it's not well, maybe. No, no, you go. It's obligatory. It's not, you can't choose whether it will or not. It's a summons. So that's what this word call means here. So clearly what Paul is saying here is that each person is to remain in the calling or, or the condition, or better still, the vocation, or even we can say each person is to stay in the station of life we found ourselves in when the effective call of the Spirit of God summoned us to repentance and faith. You got that? This is not the general call of the gospel. There is a difference. This is not the general call of the gospel to the world, which Jesus refers to in Matthew 22, where he says, many are called, but few are chosen. It doesn't refer to that call. This is not, this is not the salvation call, which many Jews found to be a stumbling block, and the Greeks or the Gentiles considered this call as foolishness. It's not that call. This calling refers to the personal call of God in one's life, which the sinner responds to God through faith in Jesus Christ. They're summoned to that. They respond to this divine summons personally as the power of God and the wisdom of God. Romans 1.24. This is what this call is. This is the call of God which, which puts us into believing, loving fellowship with Jesus. It's the, it's the powerful, effective call that draws us to the Son, as we have in John chapter 6. So what Paul is stating here in verses 17, 20, and 24 as a principle for all churches to follow is this. We should remain and live with God in the standing, the station of life that we were in when called to faith in Jesus Christ. I do all hope that you know the effective call of God. That's my prayer. It's not me calling you. It's the Spirit of God that prompts you. And uh, of course, as I said before, it's a bit like that court summons. 
You don't mess with it. You obey it. Now it must be noted here that Paul is not saying that a believer must stay, must stay in the occupations or the lifestyles that are immoral or illegal, after all. When saved, a prostitute will need to give up her prostitution or his prostitution, right? And when saved, a thief needs to give up and stop his stealing or her stealing. Neither is Paul saying any change of occupation is out of the question. And to get clear on this, we're not being legalistic here. He's not saying that any change of occupation is out of the question after all. When we think about Jesus' own disciples, they were a motley bunch, weren't they? They were fishermen, they were tax collectors. But they changed their vacations, right? They changed their vacations. And so the issue has to do with, with believers, this is what it's all about, with believers being content in the social settings and the work situations that they're in when they get saved. There's no need to change, you don't have to, just because you're a Christian. That's what it's saying here. So we go to our second point, is the principle applied to, to external cultural and religious practices. We see this in verses 18 to 20. And so the first application of this principle of staying put is not in relation to the vacation or jobs or, or, or where we are at in life, but to what we see here in the text, circumcision and uncircumcision. And it says, was any man called when he was already circumcised? He is not to become uncircumcised. Has anyone been uncircumcised? He is not to be circumcised. Now this was a, this was a real deal in that day. There was even surgical operations that they, they, some took to become uncircumcised. I don't know how that worked, but it did. And I might say that circumcision, uncircumcision, or not being circumcised was not a big deal in Corinth as it was in the churches of Galatia. Because remember, Paul wrote a letter to the churches of Galatia, and this was one of the deals. Because false teachers were coming into the ones who were already saved, and said, hey, look, unless you're a physically circumcised man, you're not really saved. And so that was a big deal in the churches of Galatia. It wasn't such a big deal at Corinth, but it was some kind of an issue. But what it's simply saying in here is this. If you were converted as a Gentile, don't try and become a Jew. And if you're converted as a Jew, don't try and become a Gentile. That's what it's saying. That's basically what uncircumcision and circumcision stood for. True, there are many religious beliefs and practices that must change even in our day in order to accommodate a new, brand new devotion to Jesus Christ, right? You can understand that. For instance, if you're offering whatever to idols and you become a Christian, that doesn't, that's not saying here that you must keep offering to idols, no, because you have a new devotion to Christ. And if you have a new devotion to Christ, you will obey what he says. And what does he say? No, idol worship is, is a sin that's wrong. So there are things that change, but one's racial and cultural identity, it can stay the same, folks. Praise God for that, right? As I look around this church, praise God for that. It can stay the same. It doesn't have to change. And this, this, this has some powerful ramifications for us today. You know, I love it. As I said, I love it when believers identify who they are culturally and ethnically. I really do. I appreciate that. I love it for thinking, wow, God's redemptive plan is just not only included whites or blacks or, or, or yellows or whatever, or from this side of the world or from that side of the world, but from every tribe and every tongue and every nation, he has included in his redemptive plan so that we can be one in Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters. Praise God for that, amen. So I love it when that happens. The Apostle Paul says that this is okay. None of you need to change or be literal. In any way, your cultural and ethnic origins. As a matter of fact, allow those differences that we have in that area to be what God uses for his kingdom. That's what he's saying here. Don't think for a minute, Paul would carry on and say, that you have to change from who you are, culturally and ethnically, in order to please him. Stay put on that. Stay put on that. But 
Paul also gives here a theological reason for this instruction in verse 19. This is where he gets a little bit deeper. After all, theology, everything must be based on one's theology. And this is what he says in verse 19. Circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing. But what matters is the keeping of the commandments of God. Now, saying that to a Jew would be the most culturally and religiously insensitive thing you could possibly say. Because to the Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision was everything. They prided themselves in that because it marked them out as someone special. Why did Paul put it like that? Why was he so insensitive to these people who were very pro-racial and, and cultural distinctives? They were, they were quite prideful people. Why did Paul put it like that? Why, why was he not more culturally sensitive and, and say like we would perhaps say? Let me, let me put a spin on this, how that we would practice Circumcision is good, but uncircumcision is also good. Uh, being an Indian is awesome, but being Asian, Australian is awesome too. Being black is beautiful, being white is beautiful, so don't try and change anything. That's what we would say, right? We'd put the good spin on it in order to be politically correct for everyone and everyone to be on equal footing. And that's how we say it. But Paul says, being Jewish is nothing, being Gentile is nothing, being Indian is nothing, being Australian is nothing, being black is nothing, being white is nothing. You get the point? That's kind of what he's saying here. That's kind of what he's saying. So why does he say that? The nothing word in Paul's analysis here, it, it puts a kind of a negative spin on all their cultural valued distinctives. Remember the Jew? Wow, he was proud of his distinctive marks. You know, some of us could be like that. Some of us could be like that. Maybe not in our cultural distinctives, but my, me and my family, we are first, last, and second, and everything else. And the Lord, and his word, and his commandments come second. We can be like that. My goals, my aspirations, my wishes, my desires, I value them. It's a distinctive of who I am. And so I'll put them up here. And won't be tired anything that comes to come to it later. And so Paul, Paul says, they're nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing. So why does he say this? Why does he do it? He says it like this because... What we do, what we are, what we look like, culturally and religiously, it's all external stuff, folks. External stuff. And no external stuff, even religious ceremonial activities, will ever, get this, will ever save anyone. They're nothing. But more importantly, most importantly, his nothing description contrasts a far more vital matter. And listen to this. It contrasts a far more vital matter. Because he says at the end of that, verse 19, the keeping of the commandments of the God. Did you know that? The keeping of the commandments of God. My dear people, this is the most important truth to grasp. Every cultural or ethnic distinction or every distinction that we might value and hold up high and even maybe not intentionally hold up high, but we are holding them up too high... And even some that we might, we, we might well own and choose to keep, all must take a lesser place of priority to obeying the commandments of God. You got that? Paul is not prohibiting circumcision or advocating it here. Just like he will not prohibit believers to staying slaves or advocating that they get out of slavery a little bit later on, which we'll see. In other words, Paul says, don't make such a big deal out of whether you are circumcised or not, or whether you're white, or whether you're black, whether you're Indian, or whether you're Australian, or whether you're slaves, or you're free, or you're rich, or you're poor. They are merely external things. You got that? But instead, he says, make obedience a big deal. Obedience a big deal because what matters most is keeping the commandments of God. Can I ask what external stuff in your life and in my life needs to take a lesser place? Pretty challenging question, isn't it? 
Because in the culture we live, some of us were talking yesterday, in the culture we live, it's so powerful and it sneaks in. And there's so much external peripheral stuff out there, whether it's wealth or whether it's health or whether it's looks or whether it's whatever or whether it's, you name it, it pressures us. The culture can easily, it's so good at dictating the terms of how we are to be and what we are to value. The most important thing is keeping the commandments of God. Make obedience a big deal rather than the external stuff. Because obeying God from the heart, folks, is not external. It's an internal matter, right? It's an internal matter. Secondly, we see the principle applied to employment and a social status. We see this in verses 21 to 24. And we get a clear idea of the social difference, differences in the, in the Corinthian church. It raises its ugly head somewhat. I always uh, think of this in Corinthians chapter 11. Remember? There we, we often quote that in our, um, when we have communion. I can't believe that a church would be like this, but they were. They were all coming together, just like we are this morning, and, and probably maybe had an upper room, I don't know, or they had a room out there and a room out here and, and, and all the wealthy ones and all the rich ones who could afford all the trimmings and trappings they sort of had their holy little huddle up here and, and, and all you guys back there who are just ordinary walking but you stayed out there right? and you just fed on the scraps if you're lucky there was division in the church even when it comes to that kind of thing and so it raised this ugly head this social status thing it was really bad and more than likely the poor were slaves And the wealthy were freed men and even perhaps slave owners. We know that some Christians were slave owners. Remember Onesimus? He was a slave of the believer Philemon. He went back to him and was forgiven. We hope that was the case. And so more than likely that's what was going down here. And so what Paul is saying is this. Simply that if a person is a slave, he or she is still able to live a Christian life. His point then, and for us today, is that no matter what working conditions, no matter what working conditions, no matter what working arrangements we are employed under, the work of the slave is every bit as enabled by the Holy Spirit to obey and serve Christ as someone who is in a higher position vocationally or who has it a lot easier. Exactly the same. In other words, the focus of the believer should not be on the external social issues of life, but rather on the divinely supernatural things. As I said before, we can be easily sucked into this, keeping up with the Joneses, uh, having a fantastic house or a car or, or, or a loaded bank account. Um, that, that should not be our primary focus, folks. In other words, Paul is saying here, don't let slavery... Your job situation make you anxious. Don't let difficult working conditions cause you to fret. He's not saying that, oh, well, if you trust in the Lord, everything's going to be rosy. No, 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 no. Or if you give more to the church, everything's going to be rosy. That's health, wealth, and prosperity doctrine. We won't go down there. We don't believe in it. It's a doctrine of the devil. What he's saying is here, just don't fret. Yeah, I know it's going to be tough, and it can be tough, and you can be suffering, and you can be going through difficult, difficult times like... I only know a little bit about it. But I might say, Paul, you a whole lot about suffering, right? I know that. Don't call, allow them to cause you to fret, but rather use your situation to obey Christ so you can what? So you can adorn the doctrine of God, our Saviour, as we have in Titus chapter 2, verse 10. That's all we're called to do. We're called to adorn the doctrine of Christ, our Saviour. That is, that we're to make the gospel, not that we can make it any more beautiful than what it is, but we can show it off to the world, right? And we are caused to show it off to the world and to our working situation. So if you're a slave, if you're a worker that's in difficult situations and being badgered and pestered or whatever it might be, you are to live out Christ, that internal, indwelling, divine enabling. You're to show, you're adorn the doctrine of our great God and Savior. At the same time, as we think about this, Paul is not prohibiting freedom or promotion or job changes. He's not prohibiting that. Many of us here have gone from one job to another and changed jobs, etc., etc. Uh, I just, this might be a time, I hope I'm challenging you that I hope this is for a good and a healthy reason. 
So he's not prohibiting freedom or or, or promotion of job changes. Just like he was not prohibiting circumcision, he wasn't prohibiting marriage, or he he didn't prohibit singleness. They're all secondary choices that we can make. If it's your gift to say single, stay single, but if you want to get married, you get married. His point is that those who are called into the fellowship of Jesus Christ, they gain a radical new set of Christ-centered priorities. That's what we gain. It's radical. Christ-centered priorities. And these priorities are, or they should be, so powerful that if you were a slave when called by God into salvation, or a free man, a businessman, a doctor, a shop assistant, a cleaner, whatever profession you were, you were saved when you were in, don't worry about it. Never mind, never mind, never mind. Paul, of course, he could have carried on here and said what he said in verse 19, giving a theological reason. He could have said, for being a slave is nothing, being a freed man is nothing, and being a doctor is nothing, being a shop assistant is nothing, a cleaner is nothing, but keeping the commandments of God is everything. He could have easily said that. But Paul takes us a little deeper on this with a new theological reason. And so the reason a person can say, never mind, even though I am a slave or a menial worker, etc., is this. The reason I can say this, and he says this in verse 22. For he who is called, he who was called in the Lord while a slave, is the what? The Lord's freedman. And the reason the freedman can say, never mind, is similar. He who was called while free is Christ's slave. In other words, in the gospel, there is medicine for the soul for those in despair and maybe suffering under difficult conditions at their workplace. But also in the gospel, there is corrective medicine against pride and self-dependence that often highly esteemed jobs are part of their package and come with. Paul looks at the slave who may feel pressured, overworked and underpaid and utterly hopeless and he says and he encourages them, in Jesus Christ you are a free man. You have been bought with a price. So never allow difficult circumstances of the workplace to enslave your soul. Never mind. Don't fret. Look to Christ and hope in Him. Hope in Him, the one who, whom you eternally belong to, and find a freedom that no freed man or even Solomon, with all his power and independence, could ever find. He couldn't find that freedom. He looked for it. Remember, we go through that Ecclesiastes. He tried everything under the sun. And then he, then Paul looks at the freed man. The wealthy man, the person who is, and I know I suggest the majority of us would be here. He looks at the freed man and says, Don't become proud of your esteemed position in life, for you are now Christ's slave. You get the picture? So there we had medicine for the soul, which encourages the worker, the person who is going under difficult circumstances. And now he talks to the, the man who has got a very well off position and, um, and is not answerable to any person kind of thing. And he says, keep remembering that you're Christ's slave. The point here is that no matter what occupies us in life, nothing should cause us to to despair and be discontent or to be prideful and arrogant. Nothing. Nothing in our working situation should be so captivating, nothing should be so captivating, so enslaving, that... We need to be or sh- uh, driven to despair or to be seduced into boasting. And it can happen. Nothing should happen that should bring on those two things. Those things, those difficulties, those, those worldly successes, we might call them. Paul puts them in the what bin? He puts them in the nothing bin. They're nothing, they're nothing. What is most important is what we have in verse 24. In whatever condition each was called, there let him remain with God. I wonder if you saw that. There let him remain with God. You hear that? Remain with God. That's a powerful statement. That's a powerful statement. You see, what matters most on the higher or lower end of the job spectrum, if we want to put it that way, 
It's not about being more content and satisfied and secure, like the culture out here tells us. It's not about that. It's not about the struggle and the difficulties uh, that you might be suffering in your places of employment. It's not about that. What matters most is whether you are being encouraged and humbled by the presence of God. So are you being encouraged by the presence of God? Or maybe you need to be humbled by the presence of God. You see, if anything is stopping those things, if anything is hindering the encouragement or the humbling of God's presence, your focus is on the wrong thing. Too much on the external. My dear people, no matter what, no matter what your cultural distinctives, no matter what your working arrangements, number one, are you obeying the commandments of God? Verse 19, that's the question. And number two, are you enjoying the presence of God? That's the second one. Verse 24. You see how they come together? Are you keeping the main thing the main thing? In other words, is your distinctives, your practices, your working arrangements hindering you from obeying the Lord and all he asks? Are they? Don't allow them to be your master. Because the Lord is. And is your distinctives, your practices, your working arrangements hindering you from enjoying the presence of God? Don't allow them to be your master. The Lord is. My dear people, it's okay to make changes. It's okay to hold on to our cultural distinctives. It's okay to be a servant and it's okay to be a master, right? But may it never, ever be that we allow any of these nothing things, which are in all our lives, we have to to live and survive, don't allow any of these nothing things get in the way of obeying the Lord and enjoying His presence. I want to leave you with a word of caution. It's not inspired, it's not from the Word of God, extra biblical, but so true from Chuck Swindoll. And it simply says this, It's helpful for me, Chuck Swindle says, to remember that our eyes are focused on one of four places at all times. On our circumstances, on others, on ourself, or on the Lord. If they focus on any one of the first three and not on the Lord, we will drift and ultimately fail. It's only a matter of time. That is so true. May you be encouraged by the word of God this morning and may he speak to each one of us, shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, we bow before you and we thank you, Lord, for speaking to us today. Lord, may your word be powerful in our lives and may we be challenged and may we be changed. For Father, we want to be more like you. May it be that we don't want anything, those external things, to hinder us or get in the way of obeying your commands and enjoying your presence. And so as we go out this week, Lord, give us boldness. Fill us with your spirit, we pray, from this day forward, so that we may even make changes that are necessary. necessary. Change our priorities in life to obey you and enjoy you. Father, no doubt at all, sometime all of us have been guilty of this and so we ask for your forgiveness and we confess our failures. But take us from this place, spirit-filled, we pray, that we may be bold and that we may speak for your name, that we may be witnesses, true salt and light, wherever we are in our communities. We give thanks in the lovely name of our Lord Jesus.